Good morning. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, we gather together to worship God and to celebrate his good news and his grace at work in our lives. It's good to be with you again, and uh, it's, it's good to see y'all doing so well. You know, this is a tough time for churches, so thank you all for being here, and uh, we, it's my pleasure to be back with you. Let us come and worship God together opening our minds, our hearts, and our lives to his word. you now to open your worship guide as we read responsibly our call to worship. The days are surely coming, says our God. The day is here to affirm a new covenant. Each of us come this day with many different things that uh, have been, we've encountered throughout the week, some things that, Lord, that have encumbered us from worshiping you and acknowledging you as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, we come this day and we set aside those things, knowing that you are in this place, that you are in our lives, and Lord, at this time, we come. We worship, we praise you, and we want you to be near us. Lord, as we come this day, we ask that you accept our prayers, the inspired message, the scriptures that are written. Lord, all this is done that you might be lifted up in prayer. For it is in your son's name that we ask and do these things. Amen. I invite you now to open your hymnals and stand as we sing, Holy, 
Holy, holy, please stand as we sing verses 1 and 4. be seated. Good morning. I am going to be reading Psalm 119 verses 9 through 16. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is the word of God for the people of God. I invite you now to open your hymnals to hymn 570. Tis so sweet, trust in Jesus. We'll sing two verses, verses 1 and 4. Trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that he is with me, will be with me till the Jesus, 
precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. You may be seated. Since I'm not really caught up on the concerns of uh, uh, prayer concerns other than the prayer list here, I'm just wondering if any of you have any concerns that you would share before we have prayer together or any updates or anything. And um, I appreciate Kelly putting my mom on the prayer list. She's now at Commonwealth and uh, adjusting. Hopefully I can get her here to church here at some point down the road. But let us go to the Lord in prayer. Well, gracious God, there's so much going on around us in this world. We look out and we hear things like in India and around the world and And it's scary just how unraveling things seem to to be these days. We look at the violence in our own land and the division and the hatred and the prejudice and all the things that we're facing. And and Lord, just like the Greeks that came to to Philip and Andrew, we we cry out, Lord, we want to see you. We want to know you. We want to experience you. We need to. And so, Lord, we bring all of our concerns to you this morning and and know that you touch us and meet us even in this moment, but we don't see it so often. We're thankful that we can come into this place and just being with each other reminds us of the power of your love that's at work between us and in us. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word and to read your word and to sing and And be reminded of of your love and your grace that's at at work in our lives, even though it's sometimes hard for us to see. There's so many things we don't understand. But Lord, it's good to come here and remember that we know that your love holds us and keeps us and is at work in our lives. And so, Father, we, we give you our thanks. And we pray that your spirit would open our eyes that we might see you more clearly. We pray, O Lord, for our our country that we might come to, to understand the power of your grace and love that is at work between us and, and that it might show in the way we relate to one another. Lord, we pray for First Baptist. With all the challenges that it faces, we know that you are at work in this place. And we thank you that we come here and are reminded that we sense and feel the power of your presence and your grace. And we pray that your spirit would fill us with the power of your presence and love now. For we offer our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. 
We do celebrate our mothers today and thank our mothers. And um, My mom said this morning, I went by to see her before I came here, and she said, well, I should have come with you, but my sister is still up here from Gloucester, so they were visiting, so maybe one of these month, weeks we can get her here. Um, it would be good for her to be back with you. But it's good to be back with you today on this Mother's Day. And, um, and we do give God thank, our thanks for you mothers, all the mothers in this world that nurture their children. I'd like to read from John chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. And this is the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. This is a bizarre passage of scripture, by the way. Um, this was actually the lectionary text for two Sundays before Easter. I don't know if you remember that. I did ask uh, Christy if I could, could preach on it again, and she said, sure. And so I don't know what she did with it. But I'm glad to give her a week, her and Shane, a chance to get away and celebrate this special weekend with Paige on her graduation this Sunday. And so you're going to have to put up, put up with listening to this again. But the reason I wanted to use this passage is because that week I was sharing with my men's group, which is, by the way, still going. <laughs> and um, they really got me thinking on this, and I wrote this sermon from that. Uh, experience, so I wanted to share it with you. Uh, but I'd like to begin with an old uh, story that I told y'all. I shared this with you many, many, many years ago. Uh, so if you would beg, uh, or I beg your indulgence with this. It seems there's this guy driving down this curvy road, and uh, he's taking all these curves, and all of a sudden, this woman comes driving up the other way and yells out at him, Pig! Well, he's incensed. I mean, he's thinking all the things that he, how, why he's so angry at her, and then hit, he was thinking about wanting to, you know, chase her down and just give her a piece of his mind. I mean, how, how dare her be that rude? Until he turned the curve and there was a pig in the road. And he hit it. I came across that story that somebody was sharing when they were talking about the issue of paradigms in our lives. Paradigms are, they're like fences that we have around us. And these fences kind of hem us in in terms of what we see, what we think, how we experience the world. There are assumptions and foundations that we have in our lives that have kind of created who we are. Now, there's a lot of freedom within this fence, but you never dare cross over the fence. Within your fence, you can challenge a lot of things, but you cannot challenge some things. You cannot think some things. I've always been interested in hearing people talk about, you know, especially when, ch when children go off to college. Uh, I mean, I did it. I, I had a professor who, who was saying, uh, 
that there aren't any really any real miracles in the Bible. That when Jesus fed the 5,000, he'd gone out the night before and collected all this fish and bread and put it behind a big rock. And then when he called the people, he, he went out and served it out. And so I was telling my mom that that's what happened. And my mom said to me, you can't say that. As though somehow it hurt God's feeling, maybe. But mostly it was, it was going outside our fence, my fence, and, and her fence. And we, you, know, you just don't do that. You can talk about God. You can talk about it, things you don't understand and ideas and stuff. Just don't cross the line. Don't cross the fence. Because, you see, your fence determines what catches your attention. It causes you to notice the things you notice and ignore the things you ignore. It's like listening to music. Two different people can listen to the same piece of music. And one will see the, the beauty of the whole thing. It's just a gorgeous piece of music. While, while the other person will listen to the, to the distinctive parts of the, of the band or the orchestra or whatever. You know, they hear, they hear the flutes playing. They hear the, the bass playing. They hear all this stuff. Other people just hear the music, you know. <laughs> Why is that? Well, you have a fence you've crafted on how you listen to music. And you don't cross over that very often, not very easily. That's why different people can see the same thing and come away with different ideas, different thoughts, different meaning about the same thing. It's why we have so much trouble in politics and in religion, because no two of us see things exactly the same way. We have our own fence that, that dictates to us what we see and hear and notice and think. And all of this is all unconscious. You never say, well, you know, my fence won't let me go there. <laughs> we never say that. You just don't go there. Or you get very anxious when you're being pushed to go there. Our text this morning is very, very interesting. I don't know why John put this in here. But for some reason, this was very important to John. You see, the Greeks, whoever they were, <laughs> they were obviously non-Jews. <laughs> they were somewhat strangers. They came to Philip and Andrew and said, Sir, We'd like to see Jesus. Now, such a, such a simple request, isn't it? Except it's not that simple. Why did John put this in here? You know what the secret, I believe, to understanding the whole Gospel of John? It's very different from the other Gospels. There's one thing that, that explains the Gospel of John. If you really want to understand John... I believe that this is the thing. And that is, if you go back to the very beginning of how John began the gospel, it says that God came in Christ, who was there at the very beginning of creation, and nobody saw him. Nobody wanted to see him. In fact, they tried to extinguish the light that was coming into the world. Now, this is the theme of John. And all through John, you've got story after story after story where Jesus is trying to open the eyes of people. Now, that's not just about healing physical blindness. It's about trying to open the eyes of people to see. There's stories about how Jesus was trying to wake people up, helping them to, to see the world. And he was challenging people's fence. All the time. You know the Sermon on the Good Mount? I'm sorry. Boy, was that a mix up. Sermon of the Good Mount. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> the Good Samaritan? <laughs> now that's a story that will shake you up if you hear it. I mean, if you really hear it. If you were a good Jewish person in Jesus' day, and you heard that story, it would literally shake you to the very core of your being. Because you will remember 
that Samaritans and Jews were enemies and they were hated. They couldn't stand each other. And the last thing they would ever say is that a Samaritan was my neighbor. So when Jesus told that story, he was cutting through, he was bulldozing down their fences so that they could see something new. You remember when Jesus said so many times in John, if you have eyes to see, then see? Implying that we all have eyes to see, we just don't see. We just don't see. Gospels are clear, Jesus had one thing, the kingdom of God is upon us, but we don't see it. We just, we don't recognize it. And this, this theme, I think, explains the Gospel of John better than anything else because all through this Gospel, Jesus is trying to wake people up and get them to see things they've never seen before. He's, he's trying to wake them up to the kingdom of God that's coming into their lives in this world so that they be, can begin to see things in a whole different light. It's a paradigm shift, as they call it. The problem is that we don't like to be challenged to shift. We get nervous and anxious and resistant and angry and sometimes we just simply will refuse to hear. But when Jesus said the kingdom of God is upon you, he aimed at breaking through the fence. And when he said seek ye first the kingdom of God, he meant that this is the most important issue in your life. If you want to grow up and you, and you want to become who God has created you fully to be, you've got a lot of, of demolition work that needs to be done. You've got a lot of fence breaking down that you need to do and, and rebuilding up. You've got, you've got a lot of things that need to be challenged. And you need to grow up. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, he meant that transformation of our foundations was going to be a tough thing. It's going to feel like death sometimes. It's going to feel like a cross. Because when we start letting go of, of, of the way that we think of things and, and, and become open to new ways of thinking, it's not easy for us, not pleasant. <coughs> but anyway, these Greeks, whoever they want, are, are, they, they wanted to see Jesus. Now, that's, that's a nice thing, isn't it? Don't we all want to see Jesus? Don't we all want to know God and experience God in our lives? And, and yet it's not just that easy, is it? It's not enough to say that we believe in Jesus. Many people believe in Jesus. It's not enough, though. Many people think they believe in Jesus but have never really opened their eyes to what Jesus was teaching and saying. When we hear Jesus say, love our neighbor, what do we hear? Well, that's a nice thing for Jesus to say. And my neighbor is, is my friend down the street. It's the people who look like me. It's people who act like me, believe the things I do. And I'm, I'm going to help them out, just like Jesus said. Except that's not what he said. That's not what he said. He tells us the story of the Good Samaritan. And he says, what you're to do is to love and care and reach out to the people who are your enemies, people you don't really particularly care for and don't care for you and certainly don't deserve it in your way of thinking. That's the fence that we don't cross over. But Jesus did. When Jesus said, forgive your enemies, that's a nice, sweet thing to say. <laughs> How come more of us Christians don't do that? How many of us harbor resentments and things that... Well, I think I'm, probably everybody's sitting here this morning. Or who's ever sat here? <laughs> Has certain people they harbor some resentment or some anger at. And the thing is that Jesus said to forgive your enemies... We don't hear that anywhere else in the world. That's not the way of the world. There are people that are out there to do you in. You need to take care of yourself. You need, 
You need to take responsibility for yourself. You can't just forgive them. That's too risky. Except Jesus did say that. Forgive your enemies. You remember that story that Jesus told us one time of the man who owed a fortune, like a million dollars, and uh, and his master said, okay, I'm going to throw you in prison. He begged with him, don't, don't throw me in prison. So his master said, okay, I'll raise the debt, <laughs> which is amazing I mean, because it was a huge amount of money. And, and so this guy is going out. He's just relieved. Man, I can't believe he just erased my debt. And, and he sees Brad, his friend, over there walking up the street who owes him $10. And he grabs him by the neck and starts choking him. He's saying, you owe me $10. What happened to this guy that was just in the master's court? And what Jesus was saying was that, hey, we all have our fences. And Jesus said to seek the kingdom of God first. He was blowing our fence apart. He was challenging everything that defines our lives. He was challenging our priorities, our values, our commitments, our passions, our vision. But our fence is so strong. So what does all this mean for us today? Well, let me suggest that, um, and at the time when I started thinking about this, it was during Lent, and it was, Lent is a time when you examine your life and, 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 and offer up your repentance to God, your confessions. I believe that this is a call when you really understand what's going on here in John. We need to come to grips with this. The way that I think about things is not right. There are a lot of things in my life that are out of sync with the kingdom of God. And no matter how passionately I believe them or think them, they need to be challenged. And they need to be changed. Or I'm going to be stuck all of my life. And, and sometimes this just comes through certain experiences you have. I can remember back when AIDS was such a big problem in this country. And we wouldn't talk about it. There was a lot of prejudice. And <coughs> a lot of hatred towards people with AIDS. A lot of suspicion until families all over America started dealing with this, somebody in their family. And when they all started dealing with it, then it, it tore down that fence. We didn't mean to, it just happened. Because that's what happens when you start facing reality. You start changing the way you look at things and the way you think about things. It's not easy, though, to ever do that. We either choose our old way of thinking and shrinking our world, or we are open to new ways of thinking. And when Jesus said the kingdom of God is upon you, he was challenging the most critical areas of our lives to be open to his will. And there are three areas that I believe that Jesus is trying to change our paradigm. The first is your view of yourself. Who are you? Are you somebody who's competing for love and affection and support and strength? Are you somebody who is, who is desperately looking to be important and significant? Are you a mess up? What is your paradigm? It seems to me that the more we get in touch with Jesus and the kingdom of God, the more we begin to understand that we are beloved children of God. God loves us, not because we're better than anybody else, not because we've got it all together. God loves us because we're his beloved children. And that's where life begins for us. And <coughs> Excuse me. I've had a rough time with this pollen this, this spring. 
when we begin to see that we are beloved children of God, we begin to understand that, that God is at, at work fully in our lives and that we are his beloved children, we, we're free. That's true freedom. But there's a second area that, that I think that the kingdom of God challenges, and that is our understanding of our view of God. Is God one who loves you? Is God one who is working in your life? Or is God a, an angry God who is um, quick to, to whack you every time you mess up? You remember Rabbi Ben Kushner said that one of the biggest problems and one of the fences that we carry around is that we have some pretty sick ideas of God that hurt us and make it very difficult to trust God. A true test of your theology, according to, um, I can't think of who it is now, who said, Dallas Willard, I think, said that. A true test of your theology is, does it make you want to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind? And then last of all, your view of the world. Is the world a place where you just compete? Is it a place where you pursue your wealth? Is it a place for your entertainment and amusement? Is it a place for your self-gratification? Or is it a place where you see your neighbor as a beloved child of God and therefore you are a servant to them? That may be one of the most difficult shifts we'll have to make. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is upon you, he's saying you've got to learn to think in different ways, folks. You, you need a transformation in your life. You need things to change. A lot of people look at their faith and look at God as just kind of an add-on to their life. You know, kind of just shore things up. Jesus is not interested in that. He's interested in coming into your house and clearing the house out. Sometimes tearing the house down in order to build a new house. All we're interested in is moving the furniture around a little bit. So do you really want to see Jesus? Such a simple thing. And yet such a complicated thing. Sometimes... I don't want to see Jesus. When I'm having my troubles with somebody, I don't want to hear Jesus. <laughs> That's fine for church. If somebody hurts me, I don't want to listen to Jesus and forgive them. I've got my life to protect. I know what I think and feel. I don't want to hear Jesus challenging everything I think and feel. Unless I really want to know and experience God and become fully alive unto God and, th and then somehow I allow the Spirit to break through and before I know it, I'm hearing and I'm listening and I'm changing ideas and thoughts. I think that's the way life works, isn't it? So do you really want to see Jesus or not? Amen. I'm not sure how the Lord may be speaking to you today. If there's some way that you would want to respond to God's word and God's grace in your life, I invite you to do that. Let us stand together. And sing is a hymn of reflection, only trust him, 475.
may be seated. Let's pray. Dear God, we come now and we offer up a prayer of thanksgiving for all the the things that you have given us, all the blessings that you have shared with us, and we have come back today and given back to you that which came first from you. And we ask that you take these offerings that we've collected, that you would bless them, you would bless the givers, that you would bless and multiply it like you multiplied the fish and the loaves of bread, and that you would use it to spread the good news of Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I ask to be seated for just a few moments. Certainly would like to reiterate what Pastor Mark said, uh, wishing all our mothers this day they might have a happy Mother's Day, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to visit with them. Also, would like to thank both Nancy and Allison for sharing their faith in God through their music this day. We appreciate you sharing with us as well. Last week, Pastor Christie suggested that if you have some comments that you would like to address relative to questions about faith or questions that you would want to ask God that you would fill out that blank sheet of paper and submit those to the church office by the end of next week I believe and also we will be having a business meeting on March 23rd at 10 o'clock in the sanctuary we invite each of you to attend that business meeting and for those committee chair and council member chair people to be sure that you get your reports in to care. Any other concerns that you need to bring to the congregation at this time? If not, we ask Mark to close us in benediction. Well, really good.
challenge you 